Welcome. Good afternoon. Welcome. Um, welcome back, actually, to the Fierce Urgency of Now Roots Week 2020 Reimagined. Um, we're super happy to have folks um, again. Hope you had a lovely rest day yesterday. Um, and yeah, before we get started to deep we're going to invite our friends from Bancha Linguas to uh, give their little message for everyone. Thank you, Indy. Gracias, Indy. Saludos todos. Mi nombre es Lila y mis pronombres son ella y ella. Y estoy aquí con mi compa y con intérprete María Luisa. Sus pronombres son ella. Somos miembros del colectivo de justicia del lenguaje Bancha Lenguas basado en Bulbancha, Luisiana. Greetings, everybody. My name is Lila and my pronouns are she and they. I'm joined today by my comrade and co-interpreter María Luisa, pronouns she. We are members of the Bancha Lenguas Language Justice uh, Collective based in Bulbancha, Louisiana. La justicia de lengua en, es en nuestro derecho en entender y ser ent entendidos en el idioma en que nosotros nos sentimos más poderosos. Language justice is our right to uh, understand and be understood in the language in which we feel most powerful. Antes de comenzar, queremos compartir sobre cómo crear un espacio bilingüe. So before starting, we want to share with you some tips on how we're going to create a bilingual space. Para quienes nos acompañan hoy, por favor, sepan, uh, eh, nos acompañan hoy, por favor, sepan que estamos proveyendo para acceso del lenguaje. Por favor, envíen un mensaje al chat de transmisión en vivo. Y nuestro equipo técnico le enviarán un enlace a cual pueden acceder. So for our viewers watching the live stream, please know that we are providing interpretation from Spanish to English and English to Spanish. For language access, please send a message to the live stream chat and our tech team will send a link for you to access. Aquí compartimos algunos, unas buenas prácticas. So here are some best practices. Por favor, hablen un paso lento y constante. Si, esto, si estás hablando muy rápido, nos verás hacer una señal de manos que significa ir más despacio. E invitamos que lo hagan también. Es posible que sea difícil vernos en su pantalla, así que pedimos que le echen un ojo al chat por si enviamos un mensaje pidiendo que, que vayas más despacio. So please speak at a slow and steady pace. If you are speaking too fast, you will see us make this hand signal, which means to slow down, and we invite you to do this as well. It may be hard for us. Uh, it may be hard to see us on your screen, so we ask that you please keep an eye on the chat in case we send a message asking you to slow down. Micrófono, utilízalos. Haremos esta señal con la mano si no podemos escucharte. Están todos invitados a hacer lo mismo. También enviaremos un mensaje al chat. So please speak uh, loudly and clearly. If you have headphones with a mic, please use them. We'll make this hand signal if we can't hear you, and you're all invited to do the same. We'll also send a message to the chat. Thirdly, otra, uh, otra vez, uh, también, mantén un, eh, tu micrófono en silencio si no estás hablando. So keep your mic on mute when you're not speaking. Y una persona a la vez. Les intérpretes solamente pueden interpretar una voz a la vez, y no queremos estar en la posición de tener que decidir cuál voz privilegiar sobre otra. So one speaker at a time, please. Interpreters can only interpret one voice at a time, and we don't ever want to be in a position to decide which voice to privilege over the other. Si eres bilingüe en español e inglés, siéntate libre de cambiar de idioma. Solo pedimos que no cambies de idioma en medio de una oración. So if you're bilingual in Spanish and English, feel free to switch back and forth between English and Spanish. We only ask that you please do not switch languages in the middle of a sentence. Y últimamente, no sufras en silencio. Si hay algún problema con la interpretación, por favor déjanos saber en el chat o envía un mensaje a los anfitriones. Crear un espacio bilingüe virtual es una experiencia nueva y requiere paciencia para ir más lentamente para así poder terminar juntos. Gracias al equipo de Alternate Roots que hizo esto posible y gracias por tu compromiso a aprender con nosotros. So lastly, don't suffer in silence. If any issues with interpretation arise, please let us know in the chat box or send a message to one of the hosts. Creating a bilingual space is a new experience, and it will take patience to move slower so that we can all get through this together. 
Thank you to Alternate Roots who made this possible. And thank you for your commitment to learning with us. Thank you so much, Lila. We really appreciate you, friend, and all the other folks at Bancha Linguas who's been really working and growing with us as we do this thing um, or make this attempt towards a bilingual space in ways that we never have before. So thanks y'all for being patient um, and for everyone who's doing all the work and labor behind the scenes. And again, if you're watching in the live stream, uh, feel free to drop in the chat if you need um, access to get um, live translation um, or interpretation rather. So yeah, hey, I don't even think I said this. My name is Indy, <laughs> my pronouns are they and he. Um, I'm super excited to be here hosting this session. Um, I am the Masters of Cultural Exuberance and Agitation for Alternate Roots, I'm working on the cultural organizing team. Um, and yeah, I'm super excited about this panel, this conversation that we are having. Even my puppy's excited. She's like jumping up all over me right now. I'm trying to like get her to calm down and stay down. It's okay, lady. Um, but yeah, this panel, it's called Beyond Punishment, a conversation about abolition. Um, and so yeah, before I get into the panel, I think there's a few, few things. One, Again, if you're watching on the stream, so I should probably watch everyone's watching on the stream, uh, feel free to join in the conversation. Um, you can do that by clicking the little icon on the top right of the screen and that says join chat. It'll prompt you to first add your name. Please add your pronouns um, in, in addition to your name um, as we're trying to create a space that's inclusive and holds a multiplicity of gender identities. So we're asking everyone um, as a part of our community agreements to add their pronouns to their names. Um, and then, yeah, and then you'll be able to engage with each other there. Um, what else is there to say? Um, yeah, the community agreements, like, so the pronouns is one of a few different agreements that we've asked folks to hold at the beginning of each of these sessions. Uh, Wendy or someone is gonna drop a longer list of the agreements. We're not gonna go through all of them now because we don't wanna take away from the rich uh, conversation that we have in store for you all. And if you've been with us for a while, you've heard those agreements a few times. Um, they're important and it's a living document. So please um, feel free to check it out and know that we're honoring that. And yeah, I think the only last thing really to say before I start introducing people really, um, it's just around our commitment to wellness this year as well. Like being in virtual space is very different. And we know that it can be frustrating and hard and it's not the same. And, uh, and it's also like exhausting in ways that being together physically isn't. Um, so we just wanna make sure that we're honoring uh, our physical bodies as we're you know, giving a lot of energy and love to each other virtually. So be sure to be taking all the time you need um, away from your screens. We invite folks to go outside, to take walks if you can, um, sit and meditate in stillness away from screens whenever possible, and also to definitely stay hydrated. Uh, our body is mostly water, and without that source of life, uh, we will be nothing. So make sure you're drinking your water, friends, um, and taking your breaths and taking your breaks. Um, and yeah, so I'm super excited first to to get into the damn thing um, and introduce the, the, the brain of sorts behind this thing, um, which is Kaden. So Kaden reached out to us and was like, hey, I, I have this idea. We need to have this conversations. It's gonna be like amazing. We need to talk about abolition and like really be clear about what this thing is. And I'm like, yes, friend, of course we need to be talking about these things. Um, and of course you're the person to help Usher and Shepherd and like uh, hold this, container to have these conversations. Uh, she is a brilliant artist and um, organizer and I'm super excited and to, yeah, bring Kaden out. Yay, Kaden, drop some love from Kaden in the chat, y'all. Hey, y'all. Um, thanks everybody for being here. My name is Kaden. Uh, she, they pronouns only. Um, I am actually um, on this call from Oakland, California right now, um, where I live and work for the moment um, and have been just, just going through the pandemic, going through my transition, going through the uprising, you know, all of the things at the same time. And 
Yeah, I wanted to say more like, how did we get here? What was on my mind? Like, I think, um, you know, I guess, wish I could see all your faces and we were together in person. But I think, you know, year after year, I've been to Roots and we do the uprooting sessions. And one question I think that a lot of people leave with is, right, how do we actualize, um, you know, some of the things around uprooting oppressions into real work? And it felt like a really um, clear way to do that and really specific way to do that, right, to, to couch it in, into abolition. And so um, I won't say much more about myself um, because I think, yeah, like we can get into conversation and do a little bit more of that together. But I wanted to start with, you know, each panelist introducing themselves, um, their pronouns, um, where are you currently residing? Um, and then I would say, yeah, like what is one, so what's one central um, issue, right, happening, one central um, problem, right, that your community is facing right now um, from the PIC? So that feels like a good place to start. If, if that's good with everybody else. Cool. And I'll let y'all do it, you know, as it comes to you. So Mandisa, Cree, or Nia, take it away. I'll go. Uh, my name is Nia Wilson, AKA uh, Mama Nia. She, her goddess. Um, I am in Hillsboro, North Carolina right now, but my primary residence is in Durham, North Carolina. Um, yeah, what are we dealing with with the PIC? Is that, would that be just about everything? Um, I think this current moment, some of the big concerns that we have are, of course, um, what's happening with the COVID and um, folks who are in the jail, being held in the jail right now. We have cases um, within the jail. Um, and so there's a, there's a huge concern around, around that. Um, and then also, <clears throat> I think, um, which I guess we could, we'll get into more later in the discussion, but I think that one of the things that, um, that we're really seeing is this current conversation around the defunding conversation, um, not necessarily being embraced by our communities that are most directly impacted by violence, because there, there seems to be a disconnect between what safety is and how to create safety in our communities and not relying on law enforcement. And so I think it's a really deep conversation that we, we need to really um, dig deep into in our community. Okay, um, I guess I will jump in there. Uh, my name is Cree. I use they, them pronouns. I am currently residing in Richmond, Virginia, um, Powhatan lands. And um, yeah, I would definitely say like the biggest thing that I'm seeing is COVID and like people being held um, in pretrial detention and like ICE facilities and having that experience on top of having their like physical health being at risk because of COVID and that, so, yeah. Hey fam, um, I'm Mandisa Moroneal and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm based in, I'm from here. I've lived here my entire life. My ancestors' blood has helped, has spilled in the streets um, in New Orleans. And um, yeah, so historically we were the hub of the domestic enslaved persons trade. So in 1808, when folks have been, um, folks were taught that the international enslaved persons trade supposedly ended. We know in the U.S. that escalated the uh, enslaved persons trade within the U.S. And New Orleans, as a port city, was the hub of where our ancestors were trafficked um, throughout the country. 
And so to me, it is no surprise that 200 years later, we have the highest incarceration rate of anywhere else um, in the state, in the country, in the world, since um, prisons and incarceration is a form of enslavement. It hasn't shifted. And so that to me is the context of what's happening in New Orleans. Um, it is the criminalization of our people. Um, it's, I always say people love black culture, black New Orleanians culture, and they hate the people that actually made the culture. So even though we are constantly being extracted from, our ways of life are constantly under increased surveillance um, and policing. Um, prior to COVID, prior to HIV, and especially um, in the HIV crisis, which still exists, um, and, and to me has been exacerbated via COVID. Um, and of course, um, as Cree mentioned, if we talk about incarceration, it's not just prisons and jails, but our state has an unprecedentedly large number of ICE centers and is building more. And so I think that that is the context that I, as a, as a black feminist and an abolitionist who is married to a cultural worker, but um, I'm not sure if it's not any like that I currently have. And like all of that is how I approach this um, conversation. Cool. Yeah, thanks so much, Mandisa. I love you and Nia. Um, two things like are coming to mind, right, is this relationship um, between the communities most policed, right, not necessarily um, seeing the value, right, initially in um, defunding, right, policing as a strategy for more safety, right. Um, and then the second part of it, Mandisa, is this relationship, right, um, between the sort of trafficked and enslaved body, right, um, and the ways in which bodies are entrapped um, in the PIC. So those those are two things that like feel like a, a really um, interesting place of tension um, to dive into if you all are you know more interested in that. And so yeah, I wanted to start with the question, yeah, defunding you know the police, right? Um, what ways are you all seeing those campaigns um, happening in your communities, right? Um, and what struggles, right, are you coming up against or people coming up against? um to to really like make that case um to other people of color other black people other you know migrant people so on and so forth right um people who are experiencing the most uh, direct sorts of violence from pic um so yeah i could talk about this uh all day long um, because I think it's a really, really interesting place to be. Um, it's, um, it's an interesting dynamic to, to experience and watch. One of the things that I love most about being um, a culture worker, in addition to being an abolitionist, is the ability to challenge people to actually use their imagination. Um, the argument of, uh, or the, 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 the campaign, with, even with um, so much um, Black death that we are witnessing in this moment, um, and the fact that even on a national scale, um, the pain, the heartache, the grief is so apparent, particularly from Black people in this moment, it is still difficult for our folks to imagine a world that doesn't involve using police um, to solve our problems, to address violence in our community. Um, and so what I, what in Durham, <clears throat> some sort of what we're, what we are experiencing and seeing, <clears throat> excuse me, is that although the abolitionists, the organizers, the activists, are in the streets as they as 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 they are everywhere else across the country. Um, we have this um, dichotomy where the support, the um, the majority of the support is coming from people who are not 
um, as impacted by the violence or by the by either either the intracommunal violence or the police violence as those who are. Um, and so, um, and, and also a lot of folks are not necessarily locally rooted. Um, and so the folks who are locally rooted and, and, and the demographics of Durham is, is almost a split when it comes to being the black and white. Um, and so black folks in Durham have a really uh, lo a large voice and a very um, strong and powerful history. And so oftentimes they, uh, they are talking about seeing people who are from the outside or people who are not black trying to move an agenda that they don't necessarily agree with. And so it's been, um, it's been an interesting place to be in, to be able to just ask folks to, to breathe um, to, and to use their imagination um, in addition to the calls to defund. Um, and so, you know, like the position that I sit in, uh, uh, you know, I completely support, of course, defunding. I'm as abolitionist as any. Um, but I begin my conversations around, well, you know, what can you imagine? You know, suppose that the police did not exist. They, they have not always existed. Why is it so difficult to imagine something different? Um, and, and just sort of challenging people right there and then talking about the other things that we need um, and hoping that that can get them to enter into the conversation around, you know, why it's important for us to think about using the, our local funds to fund other things. And so, you know, you know, a lot of the times what folks will say is, well, I agree with you. We need more programs. We need more job training. We, we need more this and this and this and that. And then I'll always say, and yes, and our city officials know that too. Um, but by the time we get to what we need, because we've spent so much money funding law enforcement, we never get that $1.5 million that the police are getting or the $70 million that the police are getting. We never get those funds because we're not having this conversation around shifting the way that our dollars are spent. So that often helps to open up the conversation um, a little bit more, but I feel like, and I've also talked to other people across the country who've agreed that it, it feels like um, we may be outpacing some of our, the very people that we feel like we, that we know that we need to be in this conversation. Um, around what it means to create a world where, where we don't have policing at all. Um, it's not reform, it's abolition. Um, and so, you know, I, I appreciate being able to use art and culture and, and sort of get people into what it, what it would take to imagine something different as a way of hopefully having folks enter into and join into the conversation. Cree, did you want to? Okay. Um, this is always like the question, right? Like in terms, uh, cause you know, Mama Nia, I agree in terms of, I'm seeing and experience very similar things here in New Orleans. And my experience has been, it's often a, not so much like not only, but it includes a, a framing of, cause like I'm not introducing abolition to a damn person. I'm talking about things that people already do, even if we don't call it that. So thinking of sex workers in New Orleans, thinking of undocumented communities in New Orleans, thinking of people who are engaged in informal economies. And oftentimes like when people say informal, we think drugs. Okay, it's also childcare. It's also doing hair, doing quick weaves, doing nails, selling plates. All those things are also part of the informal economies. How do we like, how do we live our entire life that's not mandated by the state? How do we know that what I 
um, tell the state I may make an income is not what actually I need to actually live and support five people on my block. So, so like talking about how like we already have ways of existing outside the state um, surveilling everything about us. So like talking about um, safety and conflict transformation, there are is so many people who know I can't just call the cops in this situation because I don't want the cops coming to my house and seeing I'm doing childcare for all my friends who can't afford child care institutions because it's too expensive. So how do I have to solve this situation because I know I can't call them? I don't trust calling the cops because I'm undocumented or I fuck with people who are undocumented, who I love and want to um, help be safe. So how do I have to make sure that we can take care of this person who's an abuser, of this person who, who maybe has out of control drug use in the moment in a way that's not centering something that could mess it up for all of us. You know, like in terms of, especially in public housing, um, where, you know, folks have all these rules about folks um, who are formerly incarcerated living there. So I can't just have everybody in my house because it's gonna mess up the housing arrangement for everybody else. Or thinking about, well, let's just talk about this in terms of, of Ms. Deborah's son lives with her. And if the cops come to your house and see Ms. Deborah's son on the porch, it could mess up her situation. He's bringing an in income right now that is, is helping all of us. So, so like, it's also a matter of, we don't call that maybe like nonprofits do strategies outside of the police and we're doing it every damn day. Like, like we're doing these things that at the same time, like I told my mom, she'd be like, that's impossible. That's some wild shit. You're, well, she'll say wild shit. She was like, that's some wildness that you're talking about, Mandy. And I'll be like, okay. And you're the one who taught me this strategy right here. Well, yeah, yeah, but that's that. But that's the same thing. It just has this different name to it. So also just like talking about like, and to me, as an abolitionist, I'm not invested if someone's calling it abolition. I am invested in our people thinking of things outside the state, as we always have. So I also think it's a matter of those of us who maybe have this language, being flexible about, like, I'm a Black feminist. Is it a requirement you call yourself one? Absolutely not. Do you know that Black women and Black femmes are inherently valuable and act accordingly? Because that's what matters. So also just in terms of, um, it's a framing, which is a whole nother conversation about how our movements have become co-opted and um, like really uh, in the academy in ways that take it further and further, but I'll pause there. Cree, did you have anything to add? Cool. I think the, the academic question, right, becomes interesting. I think the question around imagination becomes interesting. Um, you know, I think uh, so much of the academy itself, right, is this container, right, that is, is I don't know, like, yeah, like, I would say it's relationality, right? Is it is a gatekeeper, right, to employment? Is it a gatekeeper to having certain forms of status, right? Um, that, you know, despite what the, I think Black women, right, like being generally one of the most degree, you know, populations of people, right? Like you rarely see, you know, that same sort of, um, yeah, identity reflected um, in the people who have power in the academy. And so, um, I think the academy both, right, um, limits imagination in one way, but in another way, right, like um, controls, right, imagination and narrative far more than it probably needs to. Um, and when we're talking about something like abolition, Mandy, so you talked earlier about, um, yeah, the history of slavery um, in New Orleans and Wabansha, right, and that um, relationship um, to um, the current moment of the over-incarceration of Black and Brown people um, in New Orleans. And so 
um, as we're sitting through this and we're sifting through this, like one question, you know, I'm beginning to have for myself is how do we, you know, as culture workers, as artists, as, you know, people who are doing the work of um, dismantling the PIC or abolition, right? Like how do we um, further, right? Like re return, right? I'd say um, the philosophy, return the wording, return the languaging, right? Um, to the people in such a way that they can, yeah, realize, right, um, we're, you know, we're within this struggle with them, right? I think I would be in agreement that um, oftentimes, right, the hashtags, um, the academic language is really off-putting to people. And I think um, that's because by its nature, it is a little bit that is filled. So how do we um, return to, um, yeah, like, a common engagement um, of language, right, and liberation in this um, particular topic. And what are some strategies you all used? What are things that you found um, people really, um, yeah, get connected to? Um, ways to talk about abolition differently or defunding the police differently? What are strategies you've yeah, seen work in community to bring people, um, not necessarily bring people on board, but to like, yeah, give people a sense that we're on board with them and they're already um, a part of this process. Um, I really love the fact that we, that um, you, Nia and Mandisa talked about not even just approaching people from the sense of like, okay, I'm gonna tell you about abolition, but really on a human level, like I feel like that is a really important way of engaging people, just going into a space or like whenever you're in that space where you're interacting with people and you're wanting to connect, being willing to just listen and connect on that human level and not making it such like, okay, this is what we're about doing and this is how we're gonna get it done, but just really like listening to like what people have to say and what their struggles are so that we can like address those things. Because again, like there's this disconnect because the people who <laughs> need this work are marginalized and they're in these systems that are making it difficult for them to live their lives. So if they're already struggling to live their lives, that make that adds an extra barrier to like participating actively and like um, achieving like abolitionist goals on a greater scale. So I definitely believe like a tool is really just like getting connected, like getting in community um, and not seeing, I think something that I see a lot um, in my own community is this dehumanizing of people um, who come from, who aren't in the academic spaces, who don't understand these things. Um, and there's a lot of shame that comes with that. So really being able to understand and come to come in that space with empathy. I agree with, with all of that. Um, I think, you know, I, and I also agree with everything that Mandisa said. Um, you know, when we think about the communities that we are a part of and the, and the things that they have to weigh out, um, if they would even consider calling a police officer because of what they could lose or because of what their families or their neighbors could lose, um, as Mandisa said, in a, to a certain degree, they are already in a particular practice around, accountabil look, around accountability that does not involve law enforcement. And so I think when we use big academic terms or we make people think that they have to give up something, um, it, is, it becomes too much. It's too hard. There are too many things that folks are already struggling with um, and battling with. And so you know, in the, in the community, we don't necessarily use the, the word, the term abolition, unless someone asks about it. We do talk about accountability. We talk about what you want. So if there is, and we also don't talk about it in the moment where a harm has occurred, 
because it's a practice. It's a lifestyle. So in order for us to begin to look at how we would hold uh, each other accountable when harm occurs, we have to have the conversations when we're not in the midst of harm. Um, and so our work is the work of practicing something different. We've all embodied a punitive punishment um, mentality because that's, this is the nature of the place that we were born into. Um, and so we have to work to, you know, Kai, um, when I, when she first, because, you know, you all, those of you who know Kai, um, she's the one who introduced me to abolition, you know, and she was like, it, how are you challenging the cop in your head every day? Every day, how are you challenging the cop in your head? How are you stopping yourself from surveilling people or from looking at people as a threat or from, you know, trying to figure out what a punishment is? When you, when you get into the practice of, of sort of confronting the cop in your head, when you get into the practice of thinking about how everyone has everything that they need, you get into the practice of stop, stopping looking at people as if they're wrong or as if they're threatening. Most of the time, people who look just like you, you know, we've conditioned, been conditioned to believe that people who look like us are a threat. And so that's how we move. So, you know, this work of creating a world that does not rely on law enforcement, creating a world where we can abolish the PIC begins with our living differently every day. Um, and that's not usually the conversation that's, it's not always, I don't wanna say not usually because in our communities on the ground, we're having those conversations with our people. But in the academic world or, you know, when something occurs, when abuse of force or Black death occurs and folks want to have the conversation around, you know, dismantling the police, my question is, but what are you practicing every day? What are you talking to your family about every day so that they can see it as a possibility? If we're not having those conversations on a regular basis, then the broader community that is not us, that doesn't live this every day, cannot possibly see it as a possibility. So, you know, the academic world is important. Um, the definitions are important, but the practice, the practice for our people is paramount. It's, it's absolutely crucial if we're going to do anything different. And as Mandisa said, in so many ways, the practice is already happening, has been happening for generations. And so we, we already have examples that we can continue to reach into our toolbox and pull out and share with our folks so that they can embrace this and not be afraid. I really love this question. And I really love what Cree and Mama Nia said. So like, as y'all were talking, I was like scratching off things. I was gonna say, it's like, great. It's been said. Okay, we're gonna something else. So um, thinking of strategies, um, one of the things like that I find super helpful is using examples of pop culture, like to talk about abolition. Like in almost every action movie, at some point, somebody calls the cops and then they find a solution to like deal with the alien or whatever it is. And then the cops kind of come at the end. Like that's a plot that happens a lot. So I use that to be like, so in this movie, yes, the person called the cops. It took them two hours and the end of the movie is when they came. What did they do in between that solved the problem they were having? So, you know, it's something that folks are like, that's a, yeah, 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 the cop came with a gun and the alien um, needs water in order not to harm people. So even when the cop came, the tools they have were actually ineffective at the problem that was occurring and how that's also true in our actual lives. As people are like actually in need of housing and the response is to shoot them. People like are actually in need of 
folks to listen to them, which no cop ever has or will ever do. So like, it's a way to talk to people like about things that are like happening now. Um, and I also, I'm a black feminist and I'm an attorney. And the reason why I say that is I spent a lot of time talking to other lawyers about abolition. I don't just spend time talking to people who are not black professionals. And the reason why I think that's important is because I believe I have to gather my people. And that to me is a part of the daily praxis of being abolitionist. It's not just talking to people who I'm in community with who are not just lawyers or judges or whatever, but it's also talking to people who are most similarly situated as me in terms of how powers are ranked. Just having honest conversation, because at the end of the day, it's also the nonprofit industrial complex that is coming for our people. Like thinking of um, how you talked about abolishing the cop inside, how many times have nonprofit leaders, nonprofit workers, been the like person who has brought the cops to the situation. I'm thinking of the young woman of, of the child, Grace, in the Midwest. She was a teenager who was already incarcerated and didn't do her homework or something. Her social worker put on the report she was incarcerated. So I'm concerned because that's problematic. And in so many of our conversations of defunding, we're saying more social workers. Absolutely not. Like something more than just social workers. Cause like, I don't want to act like social workers, um, case managers are also people who are part of the criminal legal system in so many ways. So how, like, and also public defenders, private attorneys. So how are we also doing this work with folks who have such power over the lives of our people. So how are we talking about abolition with public defenders who may be doing pleas? How do we say, look, how do we support them in being like, okay, so there are some other ways this can go. Yes, you're underfunded. Yes, your caseload is five times the average of what the American Bar Association says should happen. So how do people, so not everyone, but people like myself support you in doing something different in this situation. Because how is, but then also being clear that that is not the same thing as organizing. So I also think it's a matter of acknowledging the ways that I'm a gatekeeper and being responsible about that and acknowledging it's not sustainable and it's something that has to shift. And how do you have conversations with other people who our gatekeepers and what that means. And are we, the HIV world taught me this. Are we actually trying to end the epidemic or are we just trying to keep our jobs? Are we actually trying to do this work so that one day I actually don't need a bar license? Or is the idea to make sure I'm able to always have cases? And when folks say, well, abolition isn't going to happen in your lifetime, it doesn't matter. I still have to live my life as if it's like it is simultaneously a goal, as much as it is a strategy, as much as it is a daily praxis. So even though that goal may not be actualized in my lifetime, since it is also a practice, how is that showing up, not just in how I show up on panels, but how I show up in my bar car, how I talk to other colleagues about um, what they think other poor Black people are deserving of, as if that's anyone's business but the person in the situation. So, um, and also just encouraging people to commit class suicide. You know, like, it, like in a very way of, yes, you could do that. Or you could do something else. And, like, like, and I don't even say the word wealth, Indy, because I think that trips people up. Because like not all, like most black people are not wealthy. And because we're not wealthy, a lot of people think, oh, well, this don't apply to me. As if we don't live in majority black cities 
and see the ways that black politicians, black judges, black doctors, black lawyers continue to keep their boots on the necks of poor black people. So it, it's, it's the wealthy and people who have some money, even if it's not wealth per se. So yeah, to me, like a strategy as well is gathering my people. I love the the questioning the cop inside of you, right? Um, and we talked about accountability and punishment. And why is this whole thing named beyond punishment? One, because people need names for things. I don't really like labels, but it was like, what's it going to be named? And I was sitting out and I've been, you know, to, to be really transparent about it. One thing that I've been really, you know, working on internally and thinking through internally um, internally, um, since yeah, since I had an interview a few months ago, and someone asked me in the interview, "What's the difference between restorative justice and transformative justice?" And I was like, "I feel like that's like five steps from where I want to be at in this topic. Let's go back to the fact that we have a punitive and retributive system, and we're trying to get to that, right? And so, you know, this this question, right? This the uh, they call the cops in the movie, and the cops come." far after the problem's been fixed, right? Like, where do they act when they always get on the scene? Like, who's to blame? Who messed up something here? Who do we take to jail, right? Those are the primary um, questions, right, that our punitive and retributive system is interested in. And so beyond punishment is really me asking, like, how do we go past, right? How do we move past who is to blame, right? To what happened here and who needs to heal? What kind of harm has happened here? How do we, you know, repair people? How do we create reparations, right, um, for the people in this situation? How do we improve, you know, life for those around us? How do we move closer to safety? Um, in ways Neil were talking about earlier, how do we get to accountability? Because in my work, right, we do workshops and political education with community, you know, and sometimes in spaces more academic, sometimes in spaces less so. And one question always comes up, what about the racists and murderers? And, you know, just to be to be quite honest, you know, I answer this question all the time, and it's just like my rapist is is free right now. You know, like there are rapists that are free. There are a lot of rapists that are free that don't go to jail, right? There's a lot of like sexual harm that trigger warning. Sorry, I should have gave that beforehand. But there's a lot of sexual harm, right? There's a lot of physical harm. There's a lot of emotional harm going on in communities. Um, in communities that don't have access to therapy, don't have access to, you know, the social workers who will even, you know, go ahead and, and possibly get someone locked up in the criminal legal system, right? So how do we do this work of moving, you know, beyond punishment into active healing, into active accountability around harm, into actively um, working through, right, the mess, right, actively working through the pain, right, so that we can have more healthy, whole, and safe communities. Um, and yeah, how do you all practice this in your individual life? I know we got a little bit onto that topic, and I want to also, though, um, yeah, get to, like, some very real things that aren't just um, how we practice it in our personal life, but how did you get in the work, right, and just, you know, I don't want y'all just be sitting at home readers, you know, doing, a, I love, I know y'all, I love y'all so much. We love doing that interpersonal work, right? But how do we get that work, right, like out into community and, and do start doing that work structurally as well, right? Like for more than like just ourselves. And it could just be for people, right? You know, but like how do we expand um, the circle, right? The, the no harm zone, as I think Mia would say. Harm free zone. Um, Calm for you, sorry, Alex. That's okay. That that also is a, was a gift from Kai and critical resistance, and so um, I try to get it right all the time because she trusted us um, with that. Um, <clears throat> and I didn't mean to jump in first. Free, do do you uh, want to jump in or Mendisa? Because I've been talking early. Okay. Because I'll be, I'm going to be brief because I want to hear what other folks um, ha have to say. Um, I would love, so this is for all you rooters out there. 
um, and this, I don't know, this may be a little harsh, but um, don't jump on the abolition train if you're not, if you haven't been in practice, because it's confusing. So I start, it really is very personal, um, just with a daily practice. We don't talk enough about prevention. We talk about intervention. We talk about accountability. But we don't talk enough about preventing harm so that we um, have less need for interventions. We need to have those tools for when harm happens. But what about how we prevent harm altogether? And you know, one of the things that I have to do every day is to just not lie. Um, and I mean in little things, like when I'm sending a text reply I don't say, if I saw the text when it came in and I didn't respond, I don't now send a text message that says, oh, I'm sorry I missed your text. Because that's a lie. I say, you know, I didn't get to your, sorry I didn't get to your text earlier. Here's my response. Same goes for an email, same goes for a phone call. Because part of the reason that, um, it is hard for people to uh, admit when they've harmed others um, and to begin to understand what accountability looks like is because the, of the fact that we have embodied punitive punishment. So we lie because we don't want to deal with whatever the consequences is for whatever has happened. So we, we are not accountable for our actions because we believe we're going to be punished. No one wants to be punished. So we have to make it easier to be accountable first and foremost to ourselves, but to be accountable to the people who we're close to, to be accountable to the communities that we are a part of, um, to understand that accountability is a tool for healing and not for punishment. And so, you know, abolition means that. Um, in addition to, you know, the whole thing around what do we, how do we get rid of the police? How do we get rid of cages? You know, in our, in, in, in as, as Mendisa said, you know, I, I'm sure that it won't happen in my lifetime, but I'm doing this work for seven generations down the road. And so the work of constantly talking, there's a, you know, there's a 10 year old who, who lives in, in my house and, you know, the work for getting her to understand that she shouldn't always have a quick response or answer back or, uh, to tell whoever harmed her what they did wrong before being accountable for her actions is a lot of work. Um, and so, you know, I, people sort of kind of feel like, well, you know, all this, you're talking about individual work and we want to know what to do as a group, as an organization. We don't know, want to know where to, you know, to send, you know, what's the North Star for our organization. And I will tell you that if you don't do these daily practices, your organization is going to mess it up, or that's not the word I wanted to use, but I don't know who's on here. But if you, you know, there's absolutely no way that what you do will, will be sustainable if folks are not in a daily practice of liberation, of accountability, and you can use the word abolition if you'd like, but see it as being in a daily practice of accountability in order for it to ripple out into the work that that um, that we do, and then you know, rooters, artists, you know, use your imagination. Really, 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 every day, imagine a world where accountability is the buzzword. Um, and what does that world look like? What? How do you ensure that everyone in your um, in your arms reach or in your community has everything that they need? That's accountability. And, and from there, you can build out the tools for what happens when harm occurs, because that's actually not the most difficult thing. We can figure that out. Thank you for that, um, Nia. I definitely would say it is, um, I think it's an issue of also accessibility because 
people need to have that space to feel safe to make mistakes. And um, yeah, I think that without that space, like there's, you need that space is basically what I was saying. I had more to say, but it's kind of escaped me. I appreciate that, Cree. Um, that's one of the things that um, is really important in abolitionist spaces. And when I say abolitionist spaces, you know, it was never just about jails and prisons. Um, like to me, and this is deeply influenced by Kai, who, you know, is a teacher of so many of us. Um, and Miriam Kaba. Um, and it's not a surprise that a lot of the people who have a lot of things to say about abolition that is helpful for us are Black women and femmes and GNC people. Hmm. That's me being shady, but not really. Um, you know, like in terms of Miriam Kaba said, it, it's about abolishing a system that can have jails and that can have prisons and that can have the wage and that can have these different types of inequality. So I think that is also influenced, you know, like where, yes, it's about cages and it's about how do we have a society that says, if you do this thing, that's a mistake sometimes, you go in a cage. Um, and I also think that how have we, again, back to nonprofits, I have a theme, um, how do we internalize that in terms of how do we say that we're um, justice focused and then have some of the most rigid as policies and procedures? Where it's like, well, damn, how does that work? Like, how do we have these ideas how do we get funding? How do we write grants saying I do X, Y, and Z? And it doesn't show up in the people we employ sometimes. And it really doesn't show up in the work that we say that we do in communities. And how is that not only on the nonprofits, how is that also on this whole funding system that makes you exceptionalize your work in ways that aren't always sustainable? And so like, that's something else I'm thinking about, like, you know, insofar as abolition is a, a, a daily practice, how is it showing up in the institutions that we live in? Again, to me, people matter over institutions, definitely. And within the institutions that we do have, how do we make space to actually like to actualize these things? And folks often say, oh, it's not possible it often is possible. Like, oh, oh, legally, no, no, no. Like a lot of the things like that we say that we wanna do, but the law won't let us, it's ways of making it work if you have a mind to wanna actually do those things. Um, so I also think of, um, of that. And your question, Kaden, it was also about where do we get our start? Insight inside um, Women of Color Against Violence. Um, it was a vibrant chapter here in New Orleans and I was a 20 year old member and um, Insight and Critical Resistance have always worked together and it deeply politicized me. It's how I met um, folks like Mama Nia, you know, in, in that work. Um, and it was through that, like that, I I got to see the uh, radical anti-violence world led by mostly black queer women, you know. And I and I saw that, you know, how I had been taught to see that the, the anti-violence world was only a small part of how that world actually exists. And it was um, it was deeply formative. Thank you, thank you, thank you all for that. And shout out, thanks. So shout out to Critical Resistance. I work for Critical Resistance now. Um, I wanted to say though, it's funny because like when we talk about nonprofit industrial complex, and I think about like what role I play in Critical Resistance, I feel like a lot 
of well, what I bring to the table was learned like in Ultimate Roots and in this community. But even before that, I feel like a lot of, yeah, my questions around like, how do we, you know, move past harm in the PIC started with my own need to heal from, from harms that people had done to me. And then, you know, finding myself in relationship with people who had either been harmed or had done some harm who were trying to work through that. And that very, so thank you, Mia, that very, Um, individual right individual personal like practice of like how do I heal with these people then led me to ask these bigger questions around yeah how do more people heal um, around these sorts of topics like someone said to me the other day we actually harm happens a lot we all know harm happens a lot and we all talk about how often harm happens privately Um, The reality is, though, like once it becomes this public conversation, right, we do run up against, right, what are the implications for this in the criminal legal system? And so a lot of harm then doesn't actually come to light, right? A lot of people can then, you know, in inside of, right, that sort of like private sphere of people not wanting, you know, someone to get locked up in the jail can then go continue, right, um, in their not being accountable. Um, I don't know why this question is coming to me right now. What are some, yeah, ways that you all feel that, you know, even in roots or that you all have seen other organizations that we can be in deeper accountability practices as a community inside of our organizations together um, and in ways in which, right, like, um, yeah, Mandy, so you talk a lot about the NPIC, right? Like that we can start to dismantle, right? Um, some of those ways the NPIC um, participates um, in continuing, right? Um, the thinking around harm, right? The thinking around surveillance, the thinking that's like unaccountable. I think for me, it's a practice of personal like grace and generosity, self-compassion, and that allows me to like hold that space for myself when I know that I have done something or shown up in a way that wasn't, that doesn't reflect how I want to show up to people or it has been harmful to others. Um, And I think also just like Something that I have really appreciated and the spaces that I've been in is really naming things. So like when somebody shows up in a way or some somebody apologizes for something that they have done um, out of ignorance or whatever, out of a lack of some sort of need, um, naming that as like, thank you for that modeling of this behavior because like we need that modeling also. So yeah, just having that practice of generosity with myself and with others. I I really appreciate that. I I also think that it's, um, again, it's about modeling. It's about, um, you know, so if you are living um, a a sort of, you know, way of being that where nobody gets thrown away, like I really appreciate everything that Mandisa is saying about like the nonprofit industrial complex and how we get caught up in, you know, practices that are legal or you know the the way that business is set up um and then we don't actually live out fully um our own uh, values and so <clears throat> you know um for us living out the values that nobody gets thrown away means exactly that um and so and then and then it also means that folks also have that value, um, and understand that that ta- that that value then takes all of us to work through um, when there is any kind of conflict. 
Um, it's, it's a, it's a trust building process. It's, it's a, it's a slow process. We can't do things, um, too quickly because we have to be able to, um, we have to be able to, um, do the work of growing and changing and shifting. Again, I will continue to talk about, you know, what we've embodied. Um, and so pacing is actually really, really, really important, which is why some of these, um, you know, like, you know, uh, year long campaigns or anything like that, it's, it's not gonna work. It's absolutely not gonna work. We are trying to transform the world. Um, we are transforming the world. We're not trying. We are transforming the world. We didn't get here overnight, and we're not going to get to um, the the world that we deserve overnight. Um, and so, um, doing some things to get rid of all of those, you know, yes, there is accountability. So we're not saying that folks shouldn't be held accountable for whatever standards that you agree to, but they should be agreed upon. So you can't hold someone to some sort of standard that they didn't agree to, no matter what you believe, no matter what your value system is. If they have not agreed to whatever it is that you're asking them to do, then you cannot hold them accountable for that. That is, once again, where punishment comes in and where um, abuse of power comes in. And so, you know, you've got to be able to make sure that the standards are agreed to. Um, and that, like I said, accountability is not about punishment. It's about how do we move through this situation and how do we heal from? And so in a lot of ways, it's difficult for us to, to do the trust building because we haven't done the work that we need to do to heal from harms that we've experienced our entire lives. And so it's difficult to build trust with other people. And so it's difficult to then begin to hold folks accountable because we walk in without with a lack of trust in, in every, and, and some places just absolutely are not safe. So we need to trust ourselves. If we walk into a room and, and, we, and it's not safe, then it's not safe. And either we do the work with the folks that are there to create it, to, to make the place more safe, or we walk away and we find our safe spaces and we keep it moving. Whew. That last part, yeah. Um, one of the things that I think about is the ways that um, this capitalistic society that we are in um, and the way like, that we have internalized capitalism tells, to, like encourages like these like super fast processes, right? These things that like have to happen like so, I experienced this act of violence last week. And sometimes if we intend to or not, folks who are trying to be support may feel like, okay, well, next week we have to have the accountability process and it has to start and it'll be finished. And like, how is that, again, it's not our intentions, but how is that buying into like these capitalistic ideas of now, now, quick, quick, and that's not how things work a lot of times. Because one of the things that I've learned as somebody who is doing accountability work is the importance of relationship building and you can't rush that. How do these nonprofits and these grant cycles and encourage that? You know, in terms of, you can't like, you know, of like in one year, please give me, you know, the language goals and deliverables and all of that. And unfortunately, we can't really quantify that sort of work in those ways. I mean, it's possible, like, I, I'm not sure if a process needs to take 20 years, but I also can't say that, that it doesn't, like, like, I can't say what process is for all the different types of harm. But that's an, is one thing else that I see is we think that one process works for, if I'm somebody who screams at people as I talk to them and folks like me, you know, you, please, you need to stop that. That's a whole different process than a serial rapist out here. That's a whole different process because what I'm needing to account for, which I've agreed to account for is different, but there's this way in which I've experienced folks almost try to 
commodify transformative justice where it's like okay like like you know this is the formula and to me like that also something I'm seeing in the academy and the NPIC and it's like no you can't well you can do that it's not going to be transformative justice like, like, like let's be clear about that it's going to be whatever nonprofit thing you decided is going to be fundable over the next five years and so like that's something else that I sort of uh, that um yeah like this has been challenged i mean it's been challenging um a concern that i have is and to me when mama nia said just don't lie you hit the nail on the head of we have these words of harm and violence and sometimes it's okay to just say what happened he harmed somebody. Maybe it's just me, but when I hear that, I think the most extreme thing. I, it's okay to say when she talks at people, she screams at them and people have like, and, and, and people have experiences with that. No one's saying that that's not a form of harm. It's okay to be a little bit more explicit as to what's happening. Then what I experience is we then say they harm people. You can't put somebody who um, has engaged in what I would consider non, like verbally non-sustainable ways of communication with somebody who like has a history of sexual violence. There's layers to this. And it's not to say one's more important. That's a, that's a game that we don't need to play. But it is to say, it's this way that I'm seeing, I want some other people to see it too, like this way that things are commodified almost. And we just have like blanket terms of harm and violence. And it's like, first of all, why would the person who perhaps needs some more verbal skills want to be in the same Zoom group as somebody who's a predator? And why do we think the support that the predator needs and that person does need support of some sort is the same as the person with the verbal, you know, challenges is one thing. Something else I've experienced um, is folks have conflated setting boundaries with disposing of people. You know, well, um, if you continue to do this this is not a space you will have access to. That is not disposing of somebody. Disposing is when you say you should be in a cage, you do not matter. No, you cannot have access to XYZ space and, and still get the support and love that you need over there. And that's something that um, I think that we are contending with still of like, not every space will everyone have access to. Um, and there are ways that our movements have disposed of people and setting a boundary is not necessarily the same thing as actually disposing of people, which is what the state does to people. It's funny, right? Like that language of boundaries, right? We talk a lot about that, I think in this, this like in our culture, right? I'm, culture broadly American culture right um, of like relationship boundaries and so on and so forth right um, I've started to talk about them as like boundaries and permissions right like I'm saying you can't do these things and you can't do these things um, one thing that though is coming up for me um, that I'm hearing from all of you and that that feels also truthful to myself in this work is I think that um, and then we'll get to a question um, Nia actually had a question Nia the other Nia not, not Neo listen. But one thing that's sitting with me right now is I think that, yeah, when you talk about like there's no one process, right? There's like that there, there are going to be many different processes and you can, you know, write out your process and get your grant and you can call it TJ. But if that process is, is trying to hold all these different people that have um, either created discomfort in others or um, overstepped boundaries or like done some like, you know, 
harm that's caused trauma, right? But those are different processes. And I think um, what feels real to me right now, I think to me, is that to to be in the work, right? It's not just um, in the, the individual part that um, Mama Nia brought up earlier, it's hella important. But I think the, the second part to me that feels important and necessary, right, is that imaginative piece, right? And like, leaning into the uncertainty of stepping into right that space where you can't depend upon the state where there are no you know state processes that um work that don't reinstitute harm and that that is an important practice that one i think maybe needs to be committed to or develop comfort with right to become an abolitionist right um, is to lean into that uncertainty. I don't want to like the uh, like the word lean in. Shell Sandberg really messed up lean in. Um, but you know, to like really be inside of that discomfort, right, as an imaginative space. So I want to thank you all for for everything that you brought here. Um, Nia, um, Natalie, Falk is asking, um, what are some of the ways folks have seen organizations or individuals manifest, right, these imaginative practices in ways that encourage folks to dream alternatives um, or right are there some suggestions that you all have on practice exercises and how to create containers and I think that the second part might be you know a little bit more of where we can go into because I think we've talked about the first half of that question of, um, in different ways already like right? so how do we create these containers I think we talked a lot about modeling but what are some ways you all have created these containers or approach creating t containers to um, either, you know, hold a TJ process or, you know, to, you know, hold people in some other kind of way um, that's not dependent upon and that's outside of, right, the state system and outside of the criminal legal system. Um, Um, well, we have lots of tools and, and practices, um, <laughs> but I think the most important one is the process of, again, of getting to know who your people are. Um, you know, we've got practice called where I'm from, where we take folks through an exercise so that we understand who people are. So that again, we understand where your roots have come from, what, uh, what, uh, kind of lifestyle kind of is the thing that informs your values. We do a uh, practice, we do a process of who you're going to call. So we make sure that folks have in their toolkit, the people who they need to be able to, and again, where there is consent, right? That you have spoken with someone and they've consented to being the person on your list to call. If you get stopped by a police officer, or if you need, if you have to go to the store, you know, people have consented to being in your, and I know in other um, spaces they call them pods, but it's the same kind of um, framework where you are building community before things happen so that when things happen, you have something to step in. Who are the people in your neighborhood? We use a lot of um, pop culture terminology because that's what people can identify with. We use pop culture um, you know, we, we, we talk about your superpowers, like what are your superpowers? What is your kryptonite? What is the thing that is, that prevents you from being able to use your superpowers? Who, who are the people that you fuse with? What are your fusions? So, you know, there's, we just talked about Superman, Steven Universe, like we literally use all of those different things that people can look at and go, huh, I actually fit here. I fit here. So the who you're going to call is Ghostbusters, the who are the people in your neighborhood or Mr. Rogers or Sesame Street, one of those things. They, they help folks feel like they, they actually have a place where, where they belong and that we are building it together. So there's not like any specific one thing that will work for any community at any time because we're not, and that's a really important thing to also understand. We're not a monolith. We don't want a monolithic community. That's part of the problem that we've had is by people looking at each other or wanting to create some monolithic community with one set of values that we all have to buy into. Absolutely not. What we have to do is figure out a way. I mean, some things are unacceptable. 
you know, like Mandisa said, and I really appreciate you stressing that point, because when I say nobody gets thrown away, it does not mean that accountability doesn't look like absolute, it's not safe for you to be in this place with, with us here. But it does mean that, uh, that we are not asking for you to be put in a cage, that there is somewhere where you can be safe and hopefully, and that, you know, that place is, will be made available to you. So it's really important when we say no one gets thrown away that we also don't want folks to think that we're saying, therefore, keep yourself in a situation that's unsafe for you, um, that doesn't feel good for you. That's absolutely not what we're doing. But we do want to make sure that we create spaces where people who may think differently or may move differently can work together. So we always say, you know, when you are um, attempting to create safety for yourself, is your attempt to create safety possibly causing harm for someone else? Um, and if it is, then what needs to happen so that everyone can be safe? And then that may mean that someone is not able to stay in that space. But then there are other people in the community because you've built trust because you've worked together, there are other people in that community will help figure out what needs to happen. So, you know, you know, we don't, we have tools, we created tools and everybody is brilliant enough to figure out and to create the tools, like trust yourselves to create the tools that, that you need um, in your community. But it does, you know, and pop culture is great. <laughs> it's great because that is how we ingested our values it's how we, how we, you know, as, as, as we were coming up, culture is so important and understanding the power of culture is absolutely important as we begin to figure out what world it is that we, um, that we deserve. I'm gonna do a few things that uh, we do. Um, yeah, I was gonna talk real quick. Um, yeah, so one one thing we do, Natalie, is we actually write down scenarios, and in workshop, we ask people to approach the scenario and work through how they would um, find a solution to that scenario without calling the police. So it can be as simple as you're in your apartment and you hear your neighbors are arguing and having like a really um, heated fight, right? Um, and so how do you intervene, right, or find a way to kind of disrupt that process, right, um, or, you know, make sure that, like, the police aren't called, so on and so forth, or what do you do if the police are called? Um, so we just give people, like, actual scenarios, and I generally find that um, when, you, when you put people um, in a situation that where they have to start imagining an alternative to calling the police, they get really creative and they come up with a lot of things on their own. So I think giving people scenarios and trusting that they can um, model it, right? Like come to uh, different approaches together collectively um, is one good way um, to get more of these practices out. Um, and then, sorry, Mandy, so I'll let you go ahead and take it away. Um, I'm just going to jump in. Um, so one of the ways or, um, that I see like us creating these spaces or that I've experienced creating these spaces is just intentionally empowering and encouraging those that you're in space with. Um, and so I think for me, a lot of that involves, like I said before, like accessibility, but also like inclusion and welcoming, not just not just um, acceptance, but like embrace. Um, and then, yeah, I do love that exercises where we are actively imagining how can we um, respond to situations without the police. That's something that I definitely have done before. Um, and then another thing that I wanted to say was just also making sure that people are taken care of. 
So like, if you're gonna be in a space, making sure that people are fed or that they have the childcare that they need, um, just like really simple things, but that can be the big difference between whether people can be in a space or whether people have the capacity to do that work. Um, yeah. Sorry, of course I turned off the video. I was meant to unmute myself. <laughs> Um, I've been thinking of, of some examples and I'll share a few in the interest of uh, only, only a couple in the interest of time. Um, and the first one that comes to mind is, um, intentionally messy. When I say messy, I don't mean drama. I mean, messy in terms of like, when I first came into this work, I was like, oh yes, there are solutions and they're going to be clear cut and they're not going to be complicated. So I was like turned off when like, when the solutions that, I, that are being told are like the lives that we live, right? Like complicating all of these things. So not long after Katrina, the um, New Orleans chapter of Critical Resistance um, invited Angela Davis down. And she came because she's Angela Davis and Critical Resistance. Um, and so, being that it was after some, like it wasn't that many large venues. And so it was important to have one like, like a be black um, owned or um, benefit black people in some concrete way. And so folks chose this black church. Um, and the church like uh, was like, you know, here's the you know, fee, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, the only thing is we require some sort of security. It doesn't have to be the cop, but it does have to be some sort of security. And it's up to you who you pick, like just let us know and we'll move forward. And the chapter was like, well, shit, who are we gonna go with? Of course, not the NOPD, not sheriff, you know, nothing like that, not private security because after Katrina, private security was also a part of the harm that our communities experience. Folks chose the Nation of Islam and asked them, to do security and I love that as an example in terms of you know I'm sure I can spend five years talking about the ways in which maybe the nation of Islam and I or people who organize the event don't share politics and in that moment it was a black security group that had a similar enough politic and they were not the cops and yes we could have said well aren't there some black feminists or such and such we can ask? But the reality is if they were, we didn't know them. And so it, it would be irresponsible to ask people who we knew to serve in a role that was maybe new to them, right? So also like, like that was the answer that the chapter came up with. And cause to me, it just kind of illustrates when like, here's a situation, here are the options. How do we find things that are most in alignment? Um, I also think of, um, I'm a chapter member of the chapter here of um, BYP 100. And, you know, being that abolition sits at the intersections of climate justice, every chapter member here has a safety plan. And in that safety plan is an evacuation plan or a hurricane plan in the event of the storms that come to us multiple times in a year, you know, and how safety for us has to include climate justice, has to include climate change. It's such a core part of our existence and is a core part of sometimes how people have experienced violence is evacuating during or coming back from a, a storm. So also, um, how, you know, like each member and, and we try and spend like every year we try and update those safety plans uh, because people change as do our needs. Last example I could think of is I'm a member of a hurricane um, resistance group. And basically it's a group of people across the city who try to meet about once a month and we share resources, we share strategies and we map out what to do in the event, like, you know, at the, ons the onslaught of hurricane season. 
and it's super intentional hats off to Shana Turner who started the group it's many like them you know in the region I know um in the Gulf Coast and other areas that are prone to natural disasters that are always human induced but um you know it's something that one of the things we have is for folks who could possibly host, you know, folks who, who are leaving in the event that folks are leaving for a hurricane. And it asks questions on the survey, like, how do you respond? Like, like how do you deal with safety? Like in the event of a situation, what's your response? You know, it's people in our group who are undocumented. It's people in our group who are on papers. But like, so it's important that, you know, if you're offering to host like that you're clear um, that you're clear like about what this means for the people that we see ourselves as um, as accountable to. Thank you for mentioning that about um, BYP 100 because it is hard to join in that like you do have to be black, you do have to be 18 to 35. It is a chapter based group you know, and there are some national members. So it's something like that works in that situation. I agree. It's not something that can work, but like, well, no, no, it can work in terms of safety plans aren't something like that we invented in BYP 100. It's something like that we learned from folks like you, you know, who, who, who taught us these things. So the same way that not everyone can join BYP it's materials like that we have that exist outside of just, you know, this chapter. But thank you for highlighting that. Yeah, I mentioned that in response to Kaden asking for us to name organizations. And I, as I was trying to think of organizations to name, I just realized <laughs> how difficult it is to do that because our work is so intimate because our work requires trust building, um, requires deep healing, you can't just you know, decide to join because it's about our very lives. Um, and to do that mm. work at this deep, intimate level, you can't just decide today that what I heard sounded good and I wanna join that organization. Um, you have to do, there has to be work that has to be done and then you find where you fit and what fits. And so you can reach out and ask questions and you know, maybe learn, be involved in some of the work, but it's not easy to just, we don't have, well, I mean, I can speak for Spirit House. We don't have like just a sign up sheet. Sometimes it's hard even to, we don't even have a lot of volunteer opportunities because we want to be sure that when you are working with us, you have been in practice, in praxis, because you can unintentionally cause harm because you have not been in praxis. Um, and so, you know, folks go, oh, you know, y'all are so exclusive or exclusionary. No, we're just, we're, we're fighting for our lives. And so the work is, is deep, it's hard, it's transformative, and it takes years um, to actually be able to do this work in a way that's accountable um, for our communities. Plus one on that, but if nothing else, Mia, they can shoot you some money. They can shoot BYP 100 some money. They can shoot songs Absolutely, money. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> right, like there are other ways to support the work in yeah, at times I think volunteer opportunities might come up, but yeah, they're, they're long-term commitment. Um, I was more so thinking about organizations to raise up who, who are doing the work that yeah, people can um, give money to and that might have some volunteer opportunities or might even have, um, I know CR, we often have um, webinars, things of that sort where people can like constantly, you know, think about more things um, together around abolition or the to get more into the meat in different kinds of ways. Um, somebody brought a question up, and I was just gonna, yeah, um, there's a question from Mike. Uh, Mike said, I truly appreciate this conversation. One question I have is what are some abolitionist ideas for dealing with people who wish to do harm on others and are non-reformable? Um, and so yeah, I wanna give y'all that question. I have some thoughts right now, um, but I wanna give y'all a chance to, to tackle it.
What was the last part of the question? I'm sorry, you said it's in the chat, didn't you? I can just read it. Yes. What are some abolitionist ideas for dealing with people who wish to do harm on others and are now reformable? I have, I'm going to say it. I have feelings about the question because I think that part of the reason our criminal justice system is so, I'm not going to say the word, I almost said the word because I know I have the potty mouth, right? But it's so out of whack is because um, the system, the sets of laws have been created um, or we are told that they've been created, right, to handle all these edge cases when in actuality, right, they're just um, more, right, brown, PGNC, like poor uh, people of all colors, right, um, into the system of incarceration. So, like, for me, um, coming in to answer this question, I feel like the first thing that I grapple with, right, is this idea that uh, that the work of doing harm should be focused on, you know, the edge cases, the serial rapists and the serial murders, right, um, rather than, like, focusing it on um, the everyday person in community with us, right, um, who is, is struggling, right, um, to be, you know, in better relationship with others. So that's, that's where I'm at right now on being able to answer this question. And I'm also, as Mia said earlier, as Mandisa said earlier, um, safe spaces mean sometimes people can't be in the space. And so I want to, like, reiterate that, too. Yeah, we're not here to, or, you know, to try to convince anybody or to indoctrinate anybody with anything. So, you know, our work is our work and we work with folks who can imagine things differently. Um, and if harm happens or if someone um, really is uh, committed to causing harm, then we have to find a way to create safety that moves the, the person who's committed to causing harm um, away from uh, those of us who have committed to a particular way of being. So <clears throat> there aren't, um, we can, you cannot indoctrinate somebody into something that they are opposed to. Um, and imagine how much energy we're putting into trying to change someone when we have so many people who are willing and wanting to change and not, and are doing the work. So I'll give you, I, but I will give you one example. Several years ago, <clears throat> there was a, a, a couple here um, who, a queer couple here who lived in a neighborhood where across the street from them, there was a man who was homophobic and he used to come out on his porch and scream at them um, when they would be on their porch. And so, you know, one of the suggestions that we had for them was to um, um, to get the rest of the, their neighbors to also be involved in what it would mean to hold him accountable for what he was doing. So <clears throat> when he started the screaming that everyone comes out on their porch, turns on their porch light. You don't have to respond. You don't have to say anything. You just come out on your porch and you support the person who's been harmed by saying, we're here, we see you, we love you. We're going to make sure that you have everything that you need in this moment. And he'll go back inside. Um, eventually, I do think that the police were had to be called in this situation. But it was because we can't say if we don't have something to we can't tell people that don't ever call the police if we don't have another number for them to call. So that's also really important. It does not make you less of an abolitionist to make the statement that I just made. But it is irresponsible for you're responsible of me to say, don't ever call the police and that you're feeling like your life is in danger. You get to evaluate that situation for yourself. But the first response was to enlist the rest of the neighbors to help keep them safe and to let him know that his behavior was unacceptable, not just to them, but it was unacceptable to the whole neighborhood. And so, you know, that is sort of the way that you have to move 
with people who don't want to who don't want to change. They have to see that their behavior is unacceptable to everyone, not just to to you or a few people. So, you know, we ha- again shame has causes us to keep these things secret. Um, and secrecy is the exact opposite of what we need for accountability. And so we have to find a way, but again, because accountability is connected to shame and punishment, we don't see it as a form of healing, as a form of repair. And so we have to change our mentality around accountability, see it as a form of repair, see it as a tool for healing so that then we can hold folks accountable and say, this is why you're being held accountable for your behavior. And it needs to change because it's not safe for any of us. Um, and, and we have to bring other people into the situation. We have to let go of shame. We cannot shame people into being, that's what the system has taught us to do. We cannot shame people. We cannot punish people into transformation. I don't have much to say about this question, but um, I do want to say like, I personally don't hold the belief that people are non-reformable. And I think that's like a function of disposability. Um, But I think one thing is, you know, shifting the way that you react to other people when they're doing harm, because yeah. Um, And engaging from a more human level, uh, more like, of course, like with respect with your, to your boundaries and like, if you're being directly affected, you know, honoring that, but more compassionately. Um, And yeah, oh, I was just gonna add that you can't make anybody, just like uh, Mamania was saying, you can't make anybody transform or grow in any way. Like you can create the setting, you can create the setting to which they might be able to do that, but you can't make them do that, so. One of the things that has I'm still learning and has taken me a while to understand, punishment and consequences for your actions are not the same thing. And that it's possible to to share consequences and have it and have it not be like punishment. So um, I have some loved ones who had a pop-up and um it was here and it was it was like a pop-up but it was also like they had like food and and clothing and it was a whole experience is what they called it and it was a couple of like markers that they had were like it was kind of cool you can get food you can get some jewelry clothes music little cocktail you know whole thing date night situation and so um it was maybe like the second one that they did and it came out that one of the vendors, um, you know, had been accused of of a few, um, you know, incidences of sexual violence. And so I appreciate that immediately they, you know, it was no question, you know, it was no, you know, did this really happen situations with the, uh, the people who came for it? It was, I believe you. The next thing is they called people in the community who they saw themselves like, like as, accountable to and shared here's a situation and I would like some support and how to respond like you know and what to do next and so to me it was important in terms of sometimes we may actually have the resources to um you know but it's not just the two of us so like asking for like you know more support as far as you know I'm not somebody who has experienced this harm and I have asked this person like, you know, to take part in something that I'm doing and this is against my politics. Long story short, like the person was, you know, asked not to participate and, you know, was asked, um, you know, and, and this person said that he was, he was interested in a transformative process. And they said, um, we're, you know, in communication, you know, as far as, like, as the people who, you know, who you've harmed, you know, if let's check in after that process, because it's not like 
we would never want to work with you because we know people can transform and grow. But at this point, this is a consequence that we have not being, you know, he still has a business. There ain't nobody, you know, called the secretary of state and said, you know, he should not be able to sell his jewelry. You know, ain't nobody, you cannot participate in this event that we have curated because you are out of alignment with our values. So I also think that, um, I think sometimes like we focus on what the other person is doing. Well, I don't feel like he was apologetic enough. Hold your boundary. Cause we don't actually have control of what anybody does but myself. And I think this is something again, that institutions can do because how many times have we been a part or connected to institutions, namely nonprofits who are well aware of somebody who is engaged in behavior and they play this whole white femininity thing of, I didn't have any power to do something different. Actually you did. You could have chosen not to move forward with this person. There are thousands of brilliant people in the city of New Orleans who could speak on this topic. You had to pick this person for your panel. There was no one else to talk about arts in New Orleans but this one predator, really? Really, in a city that birthed jazz and bounce music, only one, you know, only one person could talk about this. So I also think that like, like having people know and remember, and it don't gotta be all mean, there are consequences to your actions. And that we hold ourselves to that of, of you know, not saying, oh, well, this person will have consequences and this person won't. But just like holding that line for ourselves of, of, of like, here are the values that we have. And again, this is not a lot, like, you know, this is not a permanent thing, it could be, but it doesn't have to be something like that. If, it, if the consequence was this, I'm not saying that in 10 years, it will still be this for you. But I just wanna be clear as, like, as to what's happening now. Um, and I also agree that, you know, I don't think that, um, I think the state is non-reformable, but I don't think that people are non-reformable. Thank y'all so much. I want to check in with our support team. How much time do we have left in this panel? I feel like we're coming up on time, so I don't want to uh, dive into another topic um, and then have to cut it off early. Yeah, we're up. we can. I can close out now. Um, or do you have any last things to say before we close and I come back, Kaden? No, I would just thank Madisa and Cree and Mia for being here. Um, bringing uh, their best self in this moment that they were able to bring, um, sharing all of their knowledge, um, their love, but also I would say, yeah, that strict compassion, right, that like really is focused on what it means to um, be in healing and community with people, right, but also to do that in a principled way, right, to do that in a disciplined way, um, to do that in a way um, where everybody's um, being taken care of, right, um, but we're not um, trying to do that in a way that's like a one size fits all approach. So I just want to thank them so much for bringing that knowledge, um, that wisdom, um, and keeping us in the complicated and messy space while doing so. Not, you know, making it seem as if there's a right way and there's a wrong way. And here are the models that you use, and that's the only way to do it. So I just want to thank them for that. Um, and I want to thank everybody in the audience. Um, who ask questions, right, um, and engage with us and watch this live stream. So thank you all so much. Yes, thanks, y'all. Hey, um, yes, this was so beautiful. Again, my name is Indy. My pronouns are they and he. Um, 
Yeah, I want to like second what Kaden's saying and just like want to show so much gratitude for Cree and Mendisa and Nia, Mama Nia, for being on this call with us and engaging in this conversation with us. Um, and yeah, I agree. Like, I think the thing that I'm really taking from this is just like this daily, this reminder of like the daily work um, to be done. You know what I mean? That it's not just this thing, that abolition isn't just this thing that we can just like tag onto like hashtag abolition now or something like that. Like it is this like work that we're doing every day that we're integrating into like our everything. Um, so yes, thank you all for that reminder. Um, thank you, Kaden, for being in the spark for this conversation and, and holding this conversation so well, friend. Um, what what brilliance. And so yeah, great uh, gushing over here. Just been like, Y'all can't see me, but <laughs> just been, yeah, really appreciating everything that everyone's been saying um, and the way that you've been holding the space, Kating. Um, so yeah, there's so a couple of different things. So this is like the first, the precursor of sorts to a second um, more intimate engagement with Kaden actually as a workshop uh, facilitator. So this is part one, part two will be next Tuesday. Um, Come check out the workshop if you pre-registered. If you haven't, it's okay, sorry. Um, I guess you can't do it this time and we can't do everything, it's okay. There's always time to continue um, and to continue learning with each other. And so for example, if today you're like, I am so, uh, I just like need to keep talking about this and wanna throw some ideas around with folks we, have already dropped in the, the live stream chat a uh, link for you to join this like post uh, panel conversation. Um, Kaden might be dropping in and out of it. Also open invitation to you, Cree, um, Mandy, and you too, Mama Nia, if you all want to have like a next level engagement with folks, um, but no pressure because y'all have been talking for, you know, about two hours now. <laughs> so uh, I encourage folks to take breaks and stuff and thank you so much for tuning in um that's all we have for today friends and we hope that we'll find um that you'll find us again again what is it on thursday in the morning we're going to be having another panel um our partners um with the roots panel so it's the partners for change folks and also the partners in action folks coming together in conversation um so join us then i think that's all the announcements if not Wendy or Lauren, this is the moment to say that there's another announcement that I'm forgetting, which I don't think I am. So thanks y'all, peace, peace. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesdays, drink some water. Bye. Thank you, bye. Bye black people. <laughs> Love you.